This first component of the exam will be the general inspection of the patient as well as mental status evaluation. So when you're doing a general inspection for the neurologic exam, you're trying to evaluate the patient's general demeanor and their appearance and the clothing that they're wearing. This particular patient has already changed into a gown, but if they were in the clothing that they came in, is it appropriate for the weather and for the situation? Does the patient appear um, to be comfortable with the situation or do they appear to be anxious or nervous in any way? Their general affect. Next will be other orientation. Part of orientation will be assessed um, when you verify the person's identity by verifying their name and date of birth, that's assessing that they're oriented to person. But in addition, you'll need to orient to whether they're oriented to place and time. So, uh, could you verify for me your name and date of birth? John Smith, April 1st, 1992. Okay. So these other questions are ones that I ask routinely to all of my patients. Can you tell me where you are right now? Lake Nona. Lake Nona. And this building? Uh, UCF College of Medicine. All right. Um, and you know the day's date? December 19th. Close enough. <laughs> How about the year? Uh, 2016. 2016. And you know the day of the week? Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. Thank you. That's a basic um, orientation part of the mental status exam. A complete mental status exam has many more components to it. So the next part of the examination is the cranial nerves. We're going to start with discussing cranial nerve one or a sense of smell. We don't typically evaluate that as part of a normal neurologic screening examination, but if it were to be done, you want to make sure that you use something like coffee, cloves, or vanilla, specifically a non-irritating odor, as an irritating odor would stimulate a different nerve. So we're going to start by evaluating uh, cranial nerve 2 or his uh, optic nerve. So we're going to start with that by evaluating for visual acuity. We're going to test near vision using uh, the near eye chart. So if you could please take this eye chart and hold it approximately a comfortable reading distance, which is going to be about 12 to 14 inches from the patient's face. If you could please cover one eye, and please read to me the smallest line that you can. 9, 3, 7, 8, 2, 6. Okay, thank you. Now if you could just please cover the other eye. Now again, read the smallest line that you can only backwards. Six, two, eight, seven, three, nine. Okay. Make sure when you're doing this evaluation that you can actually see what the numbers that are being read so that you know they're being done correctly. Um, in addition, I always have the patient read it backwards so that you're not using a memorizing effect for the second eye. Remember, this does need to be done one eye at a time. Now that we've done visual acuity, we're going to move on to visual fields. So I'll take that card from you. Thank you. We're going to stand in front of the patient, um, approximate um, equal easy arm distance away from the patient, um, and we're going to test the visual fields one eye at a time. So I'm going to ask you to cover your right eye for me. All right. So I'm going to cover my left eye so that I'm testing the same visual field um, for myself using myself as the normal. We're going to do this by using a finger wiggle and seeing when the patient can see when the movement occurs. Make sure you instruct the patient to look straight at you and not off to the side. Because again, you're trying to test the peripheral vision, not their central vision. I want to put my fingers approximately equal distance between the two of us. And when I can start seeing the wiggling, he should be able to start seeing the wiggling. So move your hand out and move it in until he can see it. So please let me know when you can first see my hand moving. No. No. Make sure you do both the upper and lower lateral fields as well as the medial fields. Let me know when you can see my hand moving. No. No. And then do the same thing with the other eye. Please cover your other eye for me. Blink a couple of times. There you go. <laughs> Make sure the patient isn't putting pressure on their eye when they cover it, because that will again distort their vision. So again, we're going to do the same thing on the other side, doing the upper and lower, uh, both medial and lateral. No. I'm going to switch hands to do the upper field because it's easier. Yeah. All right, so that's visual field. Next, we need to check the pupillary reflex. Any light source will do. I typically will use the otoscope, but you can use a pen light if you don't have the otoscope available. Again, you need to check both eyes, but you need to check both the direct and the consensual um, response. Depending on the patient's eye color, you may need to dim the lights in the room so that you can see the actual response. So again, I'm just going to ask you to look straight forward at me, and I'm going to check the direct in this eye. We'll check looking at the other eye to make sure it's also responding, and then the direct 
in this eye and the consensual in the opposite eye at the same time. So a complete evaluation of the um, optic nerve also includes a fundoscopic exam. Now this will need to be done with the lights down so that the pupil is dilated enough in order for the patient to be able to see. I'm going to demonstrate it with the light on so that the camera can pick it up. So with the fundoscopic exam, what you want to do is have the patient focus on a spot off in the distance and try and continue to focus on that particular spot. So choose any spot on the wall, give them something specific to look at. It's hard to pick and stare at a spot that's just a blank area of a wall as opposed to a specific object. So um, there's a light switch on the other side of the room, so I can ask the patient just to focus on the light switch. I'm going to evaluate the fundus, again, using the opposite eye to look in his eye so that I don't come face to face with the patient. So since I'm going to start, I'm going to start on this side of the patient. So again, just pick that spot on the wall and continue to stare at it. I'm going to anchor myself on the patient so I have some idea as to how close I am. And I'm going to move in evaluating the patient's optic disc and the blood vessels as well as the other parts of the retina. It should only take a few moments in order to do that full evaluation and make sure you look at both the optic disc as well as the remainder of the retina. And now switch eyes. So again, I want you to again continue, if you blink a couple times if you need to <laughs> from the bright light, I'm going to switch eyes and do the same thing. Anchor on my patient, come in and evaluate both the optic disc as well as the macula. So now what we're going to do is evaluate extraocular movements. In order to do this, what we do is have the patient follow an object with their eyes without turning their head and instruct the patient to do so. You can use any object you prefer. I usually just use my finger. So if you would just please look straight forward and then follow my finger with your eyes, but don't turn your head. What you want to do is have the patient move to the extremes of vision. So out laterally, up, and then down, back through the center again to the opposite side. And this will catch all the cardinal movements. In addition, you want to make sure you test convergence where you have the patients cross their eyes. So that evaluated convergence, uh, and if I want to also evaluate for accommodation and watch the pupillary response, make sure you're standing close enough to the patient to see the change in the pupil size. So next what we're going to evaluate is facial sensation or the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve 5. The first part of evaluating that is going to be the corneal reflex. Um, however, the corneal reflex is only checked when a patient has an abnormality with a high suspicion of that being deficient, um, and we never test it on standardized patients. So I won't be demonstrating it here today. Uh, but we do need to make sure we test all three segments of the trigeminal nerve for facial sensation. So we need to get V1 in the area of the forehead, V2 in the area of the cheek, and V3 in the area of the lower jaw. We do this with light touch only. Uh, so what I'm going to do is make sure that the patient can do the sensation on both sides and that it's equal bilaterally. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and let me know where you're feeling it and tell me if it's equal on both sides. On my forehead, equal. My chin, equal. Cheeks, equal. Okay, thank you. Next what we need to evaluate is the muscles of facial expression or cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. So what I'm going to ask you to do is smile or big for me and show me your teeth. All right, you can relax. I want you to close your eyes really, really tight. Don't let me open them up. All right, and rise your eyebrows for me. All right. So again, we've checked essentially a brief screening of all mo motions of the face. Um, and with that, we can see that they are equal bilaterally. Uh, and next we want to do is check hearing or cranial nerve 8. We're going to do that with a finger rub test. And in this situation, this is a rough screening. Any abnormalities that you get here, you'll need to make sure you have to send the patient for further testing. So what I want to do is make sure that they can hear a very soft sound in both ears. I'm going to do that with my finger rub. I want to make sure that you do it by yourself to make sure that your finger actually makes noise. Um, if you've just lotioned your hands, it may not make any sound. Um, and then let the patient know what you're going to do. This is the sound I'm going to do. What I'd like you to do is tell me when you can hear it on which side. All right. So if you could close your eyes for me. I have the patient close their eyes because I don't want them to use visual cues um, to be able to tell where the sound is coming from. Right. Left side. Left side. Right side. All right. 
So now the patient has heard it on both sides. So next what we want to do is evaluate for things like from cranial nerve 9, which would include the gag reflex. Again, that will be touching something to the posterior part of the pharynx and seeing if the patient has a gag response. Again, we only do this in a situation where we suspect an abnormality, and again, we don't test this on standardized patients. However, we can evaluate for palate rise um, by looking at the back of the throat, having the patient say, ah. So if you could open up your mouth for me and say, ah. Ah. Uh and relax. Um, so again, what I should see there is the palate and the uvula rising in the midline. Again, now if you could have you stick out your tongue for me and move it side to side. All right. So what I've done then is since I'm already in the patient's mouth, I can evaluate for a cranial nerve 12 of the hypoglossal nerve by looking for tongue protrudement, which should be um, equal in the midline. Finally, we're going to check the spinal accessory nerve by checking for movement of the uh, sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So I'm going to ask you to shrug your shoulders and don't let me push them down. So hold them up. Okay, you can relax. And now having the patient turn their head against my hand. So just turn your head against my hand and now the other direction. Right. So we have equal strength bilaterally by testing both of those segments of the spinal accessory nerve. So that completes the evaluation of the cranial nerves.